about your relationship with your father. Some maybe are very good, some um, might not be very good, some maybe had never a relationship with the father, but our Heavenly Father wants to have a relationship with each one of us. And, and I really think that's a beautiful thing. And it's something that is even more special between us and our earthly father. And so I just would like to ask if you can also join me in asking for our father in heaven um, to, to talk to him and you know, in your heart and as I lead you also to the throne of grace that, that you will be trusted that he will be here in your prayers. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are our Father. You, we can call you as our Abba, our Dad, and you know exactly where we are at right now. We thank you that not only that you created the universe, but you created each one of us. You know the number of hairs on our head. You know where we came from. You know all the junk that is around us. You know, Father, all the bits and pieces that are just a mess in our lives. And yet, Father, you, you love us. And you care for us. And you never stop watching over us. And many times, Father, we, we turn our backs to you. And we refuse to accept that you exist, or we refuse to accept that you care for us. And Father, we are sorry. We are sorry for the times when we doubted your principles. We're sorry that we have not kept according to what you're asking through your commandments. We are sorry that we have not spent time with you. We are sorry for our words, for our thoughts, that are not necessarily clean. For our pride, for our arrogance, for our indifference to things that we should actually consider. Father in heaven, we pray for forgiveness. We pray that you will cleanse us, Lord, by the blood of Jesus, because your word tells us that he has redeemed us already by his blood. And we thank you for this. And Father in heaven, we thank you for all the things that you have given to us, the blessings, things over where we can stay, where we can sleep, what we can eat, what we can wear, what we have earned, what we have received. All of these things, Father, come from you. And we thank you that when we depend upon you, that you will not be running away or feel that we are just taking too much of your time, but that you are so ever ready to help us. You are so ever ready to hear all of us. And Father, we pray that as we walk away from this place today, that we can actually be drawn closer to you and walk on a new walk with you this week. And Father in heaven, we ask for the Holy Spirit because we know that we cannot even repent without the Holy Spirit. We cannot even understand without the Holy Spirit, nor even pray to you. And we pray for the Holy Spirit upon each person now, upon me, upon everyone here, Lord. That we can hear you, and that we can be drawn to you, and that we can have an intimate connection with you this week. May this new week be a different week compared to what we have had. And Father in heaven, we just want to ask, Lord, that you'll be with our program today. May you be with the speaker, um, Pastor Kevin Brown. Fill him with the Holy Spirit that he's able to draw us to attention of what you want us to understand and take away. We pray, Father, that you'll give him the words to speak. We also pray for our ministry here at Fountain in the City. We ask for your blessings. We ask, Father, your hands will be upon it, that you will give us wisdom and understanding in how to carry out the responsibility that is according to your will. We also thank you, Father, for our friends here, 
We pray, Father, for our friend Gilly, who is really sick in bed in the hospital right now. You know, Father, how he's really been struggling to just breathe. The very thing that we're so used to um, experiencing without us even thinking that he even struggles to breathe. And Father, we pray, please give him healing. Please give him peace. Please be with Sylvia and Rebecca, that they also will have peace and they will find peace in you. We pray, Father, for the Holy Spirit to guide the doctors and give them wisdom and understanding. We pray as well, Father, for Jackie's mum. We ask, Lord, that she will also experience healing. You know, Father, that every single week she has to struggle with this, Lord. And, Father, we want to submit it to you. We pray for Jackie's family and relatives, Lord, who are supporting them over there. And Jackie and, and Joey and Isabella, that they are far from them right now. And, Father, we pray that your hands will be upon the family. We also pray, Father, that you'll be with Cheryl that you'll be with her and that you will strengthen her, Lord, with the struggle that she has with her knee and also with her heart. Please guide her. And Father, you know um, each home here has its own challenge and the challenges in each person's lives. We want to submit it to you and surrender it to you, Father, from our heart. We thank you for the ways in which you have blessed us and that we can return also what you have given to us back again to you because everything that we have really is yours. And we ask, Father, that the money that has been collected will really be multiplied by you in order for your work to be done. Thank you so much, Father, for hearing our prayers and that your ears are never too heavy to hear it and your arms are never too short to save us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's great uh, to be able to share a message with you this afternoon here, and uh, it's been quite some time since I've been uh, at the front, and it's quite daunting. So you can just uh, pray for me quietly while I'm sharing what I have to say today. About uh, this time last year, in, it was July last year, I visited my blood specialist. Um, some of you understand I have a blood disorder, and um, I have a regular visit four times a year to my haematologist. And that's been going on for quite some time. Anyway, I visited him last July, and um, he said to me when I went in and sat down, he said, I've got some good news for you today. I said, what's that? He said, you're still alive. <laughs> and um, he wasn't joking. And I sat down and we had a long chat, and uh, he, he shared with me that uh, people with my condition that he's worked with over many, many years uh, have a prognosis of about 18 months for three years of life without being diagnosed and treated. So it's quite a serious disorder I have. But with the appropriate treatment, you could expect to live up to 20 years after diagnosis. And uh, the reason he shared with me that it was good news today was that it is now 23 years since I have been diagnosed. So I'm very fortunate, I thank God, that uh, not only am I alive, but I'm alive and well. Um, he said to me, he's absolutely amazed at how well I have been for these past 23 years and how, uh, how stable my health has been throughout that length of time. And so uh, I, I'm very thankful and praise God that uh, he uh, led me into the Seventh-day Adventist movement uh, almost 30 years ago, uh, which of course includes uh, some fairly significant lifestyle improvements that uh, compared to what I had been living like prior to, my, to becoming a Christian. You know, alcohol, drugs, cigarettes, all kinds of anything that was edible, or was considered edible, I ate it. And um, so God helped me uh, make some fairly significant changes in my lifestyle practices. And uh, when I told my uh, hematologist back, right back in the beginning there, that I was a vegetarian, and he said, that's serendipitous. He says, a very good thing that, uh, that you have a vegetarian lifestyle. So, Again, praise God for that, that he brought that health message to our church. So last July I was confronted with this, uh, this reality that I was just, you could say, blessed or fortunate or lucky to be alive even, let alone to be so well. And uh, so time went on and I talked to my wife about this and uh, we, we started thinking about uh, what we, how we ought to be living our lives. Is there other, other improvements we could uh, implement to 
to even to improve, that the opportunities stay alive a little bit longer still. And so uh, my wife, uh, I'm not sure if, if you know my wife too well, but she's a very determined person. And uh, she has helped, you could say forced, some uh, lifestyle um, improvements for me in that last tw during that last 12 month period. And I thank God for my wife also. In January this year, just about six months ago, I was awoken in the middle of the night, 3 a.m., which is very, very unusual for me, with a um, quite uh, some serious discomfort. I went to the bathroom, and while I was there, I experienced what I thought was a heart attack. You see, with the condition I have, with my health, my blood disorder, a uh, heart attack is the most likely thing to happen to you that will bring it all to an end. Uh, stroke or heart attack, very, very high uh, possibility of that. There's some other, other things could happen too, but this particular night I'd woken up, I was, um, I'd gone to the bathroom, as I said, and I thought I was having a heart attack. I had, I had uh, a racing pulse. I was getting breathless. I began to panic a bit and uh, began to feel dizzy. Anyway, so I eventually uh, woke up my wife and called an ambulance. Ambulance arrived quite quickly. <coughs> did a few quick tests and then decided to take me to the emergency department of the hospital. Spent two or three hours there, I think, and being me, I decided I'd get up on Facebook four o'clock at the hospital and put a few pictures of myself in the emergency ward on my Facebook page. And um, anyhow, so they determined I had a, uh, a, it wasn't a heart attack. My heart was in pretty good condition as far as they, was con they were concerned. Nothing to be anxious about. And so we went home, everything seemed okay. So that was January this year. And uh, as many of you know, in April this year, um, tragically my son took his life. And um, this of course has led to quite a significant um, degree of depression, anxiety, stress, uh, made it very difficult for me to go about living a normal life. And uh, some of that's led to some physical symptoms of yeah, tightness in the chest and breathlessness. And uh, so I've been quite a bit, a, bit, a bit worried about that. And so I went back to the GP, my doctor, and she said that um, I should go and see a cardiologist because uh, they needed to rule out that there was anything actually wrong with my heart before they looked at any other potential problem. And so I said, fair enough. She gave me a referral to go and see the specialist, the heart specialist, and uh, I threw it in the circular file at home. I, I put it in the bin because I didn't want to go. Probably a typical Australian male response. Um, time went on a little bit further and um, these symptoms persisted, my anxiety particularly, and that's that uh, tightness across my chest and um, difficulty in breathing. And so, I went back to my GP and she had a few different ideas and one of them of course included going back to see the cardiologist which I had not done and so I agreed to do that and uh, just recently I, I did do that and when I went to the cardiologist I was um, not a very, in a very happy place and uh, started off by having a fight with him when I went, when I went into his office. and. Um, he, he reciprocated by giving me a bill for $814. <laughs> I think he had the last laugh there. But um, they put me on the walking machine, you know, the, the stress test, they put me on the walking machine and just put, started off fairly slow. Oh, they did an ultrasound on my heart first, shaved a bit of hair off my chest and stuck these things on and did the ultrasound. And then they put me on this machine, the walking machine, and slowly but surely they kept increasing the pace of this machine until I was running. And she said, oh, you, you've got a good heart, you, you, you're not, you must be very fit. Your heart rate won't go up, it's still going good. And so they increased faster and faster until I felt like I was going to drop oh. down the spot. <laughs> they had me working that hard. And uh, until they got my heart rate up to the right level so they could then put me back on the, on the couch and do the ultrasound again and just, see, just have a look at my, the blood vessels in my heart to see if there's any blockages and so forth. And so they, um, they did that and then I went into the cardiologist's uh, office after that again. He said that um, 
He was very happy with the results. There was no sign of any blockages in my, the arteries of my heart. But he said, um, he, he recommended that I should go and have a CT scan just to ensure that there was no narrowing or, or any significant narrowing of the arteries that the ultrasound wouldn't pick up. So I reluctantly agreed to do that and uh, just two weeks ago I went and had a CT scan and had a fight with them also. <laughs> and um, eventually that all went through. And then last, I think it was last Thursday, they um, sent me my results. And um, the basic outcome of that was, well, very, very good. The, they were reading a scale from zero to 400. Uh, the calcium deposits in the arteries of the, of the heart that they scan. And um, if you're in the zero to 10 range, that's considered excellent. You have no chance of any heart disease or, or heart attack. If you're in the 10 to 100 range, that's considered very good. You're in a very, very safe range. And my, by the way, my reading was 19. So I was in the bottom of that safe range, a very good range. And from 100 up to 300 is considered a moderate risk of heart disease and heart, heart attack. And from 300 plus, you basically need to be in a hospital getting attention. So again, I haven't been back to my cardiologist yet to get the official uh, interpretation of those results, but Dr Google has been uh, helpful. And I've uh, been there and diagnosed myself and I'm thinking, I don't think I'll go back to the cardiologist and spend another $814. But no, I will have to go back. But nonetheless, I, uh, as you can imagine, um, this whole process over the past 12 months has created, created its own anxiety uh, and caused me to, concern, to be concerned a little bit about my heart. I'm not, um, I'm not young anymore. I may look fairly young, but I'm actually uh, getting on and uh, I'm comfortable with that. And so, as I said, I've been uh, led to think a lot about the condition of my heart, as you can imagine, you would be too. And so uh, that began to take me down another path and make me wonder about the condition of my heart in relation to God, the spiritual condition of my heart. And then, of course, uh, it led me to think, as a, being a pastor, having a pastor's heart, that led me to think about the condition of your hearts, wondering how your relationship with God's going. And uh, so that, that's what sort of led me to think about what I should talk about today. And the title of the message for today is, How is Your Heart? And um, so we want to open up our Bibles today and just see what God has to say, because after all, he is the great physician. He has far greater insight into the condition of our hearts than any cardiologist or CT scan would have. And so let's uh, look together and see what God has to say about the overall condition of the human heart and perhaps uh, whether we can see a prognosis, a diagnosis and a prognosis as to how any difficulties may be dealt with. Let me see where my file is here. I hope it doesn't. Oh, there it is. Very good. Okay, we're going to go into the Old Testament to start with. In Isaiah, chapter 1, and verses 5 and 6. I won't, we won't have time to slow down for you. I need to move fairly quickly. Uh, it's already after 4 o'clock. So I'm just going to read out the text. I've already written them down in my notes here. So... Isaiah chapter 1 and verses 5 and 6 says this, and this is a, that's diagnosing any potential heart problem we may need to be aware of. It says here, the whole heart, oh, sorry, the whole head is sick and the whole heart faints. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it. But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, they have not been closed or bound up or soothed with ointment. Well, for a starting point, that uh, doesn't sound too promising, does it? I'm sure my uh, cardiologist, if he had have looked at my heart and seen that condition, he would have been putting me straight into the um, emergency ward. Um, but who is it he's talking to? He's talking about the condition of Judah and Jerusalem. We're talking way back now, 2,700 plus years ago, and his people are in a pretty pitiful state. Uh, their, their spirituality is in, in a terrible state, actually. And this is because of their immorality and idolatry 
they are resisting God's uh, pleads, pleading, and um, are rebelling against his, uh, his, his leadership over them. Um, in terms of the New Testament, Paul in the book of Romans says that um, it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. So when we talk about our potential heart problems, we see that this is a universal issue. Every human being in the world has a problem. And it says that none of us are righteous, none, no, not one. There is none who understands, there are none who seeks after God. They've all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Again, a very pitiful uh, diagnosis of the human condition. And it goes on a little further to say, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, I don't, I don't say these things to, uh, to put uh, criticism toward anybody. This is a message I've been looking at and in terms of my own relationship with God. The human condition is what it is. And uh, when we want to get an honest diagnosis of our condition, we go to a specialist, don't we? And if we're serious about understanding our true spiritual condition, we need to come to God and ask him what he believes our condition is. Because unless we get a correct diagnosis, we're not going to get a correct prescription or a remedy to our problem, are we? And so we have to be honest and let the professionals tell us uh, what our true condition is. <clears throat> and of course, in this context, Paul was talking and comparing and contrasting the Jews with the Gentiles. The Jews, of course, thought they were superior to the Gentiles, but he's making it very clear to them they have no grounds for boasting. Every one of us, none of us have any claim to boast. Every one of us is a part of this problem. There is none who does good, no, not one. Back into the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 17 and verses 9 and 10. It says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. So God uh, is not like a, one of us who only look upon the outward appearance. We can only uh, judge on the appearance that we see on the exterior, the behaviour. We can uh, make some uh, assessment of a person's character by the way they behave, the attitudes they, they present and cherish. We're able to make some external sort of evaluation of the kind of person they may be. Because God looks way beyond that. He looks past the, su the surface. He looks right into our hearts and minds and he knows exactly where we're at both on a universal level as well as on an individual personal level. He knows us, each one, doesn't he? Yes. And so when he says that our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, that's a quite a challenging thing to come to terms with. You know, in our humanity, we, uh, we see ourselves as um, upright. We are standing on our two feet. We are able to think and to do and to be and uh, live apart from God and his diagnosis. We can choose to do that if we want to. But if we want to understand our true condition, we have to take seriously what God has to say. Again, in its context, Jeremiah is talking about the condition of God's people back there, um, back in the 5th century, 6th century BC. In the book of Matthew, back in the New Testament again, Jesus, I think, in speaking here says, For out of the heart... Proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and that, and uh, sorry, and blasphemies. Here, of course, this is a, a context of Jesus speaking to the Pharisees. These people had uh, gone out of their way to destroy Jesus. They conspired. They plotted. They tried to entrap him. They did everything, and ultimately, of course, they killed him or had him killed. And Jesus, of course, is having a direct attack on them here, talking about their need to parade their so-called righteousness around in everybody else's face, to boast about the tithes and offerings they give and the way that they do all these other great good deeds and pray publicly. And Jesus, of course, is rebuking them for their hypocrisy, the way they uh, see their own spiritual condition in such a um, false light. And uh, But there is an application we need to take on board as well. I won't uh, torture you too much more with some of this this negative uh, diagnosis that God, we find in God's word, but I'll let, let this be said here, that um, in Jeremiah again, speaking to the people uh, before they were taken off into Babylonian captivity, he says this to them. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? 
or the leopard change its spots? Then may you also do good who are accustomed to doing evil. And so while we, uh, if, we are, if we accept God's word for what it is, we are left in a very difficult situation because our, our condition is described as in very graphic language. And now we're told that there's nothing we can do about it. That's just our state of being. That's, that's who we are, how God sees us. And uh, there's nothing we can do to change that. And that puts us in a very, very perilous position. Unless we recognise the, the, the truthfulness of these statements, our, our condition, our state before God, we're unable to change our heart. They can't. And we can't either change our heart. We can't just pick ourselves up by our bootstraps and just change who we are. We inherited a sinful nature from our first parents, Adam and Eve. And uh, that's, that's, what we are, that's what we're born with. That's what we live with. That's what we're left to deal with. And so we are in a truly uh, difficult uh, place. And only uh, as we turn continually to God's word can we find uh, a, a, a solution to our, our condition. So we may be able to you know, perform outwardly things that we think recommend us to God. We may keep the Sabbath holy. We may come to church and, and generously support the church with our offerings. We may faithfully pay our tithes. We may support the weekly prayer meetings and do all the other things that are outwardly right. And we may be able to uh, successfully have others think very well of us because of all these things we do. And we may even come to the place of thinking very well of ourselves because of the things we do. Because we are looking on the outward appearance, aren't we? We're looking at the outward performance. But God looks on the heart. He looks beyond this facade, this mask, this pretense. And uh, he gives us an honest evaluation of just who, what we're really like. And the things he's told us here are quite confronting. So our outward performance does not impress God. As that we may be able to impress others and we oftentimes impress ourselves. And, you know, um, as I looked at the results of these various things over the past 12 months, I was feeling pretty pleased with myself. You know, a cholesterol level of about 2.7, you know, below average um, blood sugar level. <clears throat> the, you know, the reading of 19 on my calcium readout for my heart uh, CT scan. I was feeling pretty pleased with myself. My doctor's report saying, you know, you, you, your health has been so good for these 23 years. You've been so stable and well. I began to feel pretty good about that. But you cannot overlook the fact that there is an underlying condition which will kill me, unless I get hit by a bus before, beforehand. <clears throat> and so there is a, uh, there's a real mortality about that. And uh, you know, we, can, we can think about it superficially and think we're okay, but we're not. And only as we turn to God and look for him for solutions to our problem uh, do we have a find, find ourselves a way out. I'd just like to um, just reflect on that for a moment longer with the story of the time when God chose a new king for Israel. You may remember that um, the children of Israel decided they needed their own king and uh, God gave them what they wanted and Saul became their king. He was tall, he was head and shoulders above the rest and he was strong and a military man and had a lot going for him according to the way that men considered. And... Um, they, they chose Saul and uh, he, he was their king. It wasn't too long, of course, when they regretted that. And so God sent uh, Samuel, his prophet of the time, to go and anoint a new king that would take the place of Saul. And uh, Samuel came to the, to the, the township, the village, or wherever it was, uh, to Jesse. He said he was told to go to, the, to Jesse and uh, he would find there who God had chosen to be their new king. I'll just read this brief passage here. It says, And so it was when they came that Samuel looked upon Eliab. Now I think Eliab was the oldest child of the family of about seven or eight boys. Samuel looked upon Eliab and he said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. This is the one, surely, that God has sent me to anoint. 
to be the new king of Israel. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so if you are familiar with the story, Samuel went along the whole long line of these sons of Jesse, and uh, God said, no, 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 no. Is there any more? And of course, ultimately, young David, out there caring for the flocks, was called, and God said, this is the one. The one, this unassuming young lad with ruddy cheeks and uh, a fire in his heart. God uh, said, this is the one. And so Samuel anointed David, and ultimately, of course, David did become the king. So we uh, need to take uh, serious this need for us to look beyond the outward appearance, what we can see and how we might judge ourselves and others and uh, take a deeper look at the scriptures and find out the diagnosis that God has for us. So we're going to turn now to some bit of better news for the rest of our uh, presentation today. And uh, you may be familiar with the story where Jesus met with Nicodemus one evening. Nicodemus uh, requested a, an interview with Jesus and they met and they had a conversation. Nicodemus was on one page and Jesus was on another page and uh, gently but surely Jesus led Nicodemus to the place where he needed to really hear what Jesus was trying to say to him. And he said to, uh, to Nicodemus, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you that you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And so when it says there that you must be born again, the Greek language also allows for this to mean you must be born from above. You must be born from outside of yourself. You cannot change yourself. Just like a leopard cannot change its spots, or an Ethiopian change the colour of his skin, nor can we change our hearts. We need a power from outside of ourselves to do that miraculous transformation in our lives. Of course, that requires us to submit to that, to acknowledge our true condition, and then submit to that process whereby God gives us new life, a new heart something we can never do for ourselves. We must allow God to do the work that only he can do. It may be a mystery. We may not understand all the, the particulars of how it works. Just like the wind blowing through the trees, we can't see where the wind has come from or where it's going. But we can certainly see the effects of that wind on the leaves of the tree, can't we? And uh, so it is with the Holy Spirit. We may not understand exactly how God does this miraculous work of transformation in our lives, giving us this new heart experience. But nonetheless, it is very real just as real as the wind blowing through the trees. In the book of Romans, chapter 5 and verse 5, I'm going to use a, a paraphrased version here uh, called the New Living Translation. It just states it a bit easier. It says this, And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us. Because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. And so as we recognise our, our condition, our need, as we uh, submit ourselves to God and invite him to come into our lives through the presence of his Holy Spirit, it says he will pour out his Spirit into our hearts and uh, it is hearts fill our hearts with his love. There's the transformation that's required to change us from selfish, self-centred human beings into selfless, giving, uh, other-centred people, human beings, so that our love will become, will become real. It'll be not just a self-centred love, but a love that God pours into our hearts and leads us to love others as God loves them. It leads us to love God as he deserves. And uh, only through the miracle of God working in us is this ever possible. And Jesus said in another place, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, 
you will by no means enter the kingdom of God. God wants us to allow him, allow, he wants us to allow him to bring this change about. Unless you are converted, this is in the passive form. It's something that God's, God does in us. It's not something we do ourselves in an active sense. The Greek language is very clear on this. Unless you are converted, it's something that's done by God for you, to you, in you. And that conversion, unless you become converted, is a change, a transformation, a change of direction. Um, and it's done in a, um, a way that is a completed action. The transformation is a completed action. Again, the Greek language is very, very clear on this point. This is not something that uh, is, a, is a, a process of time. This is something that happens in the immediate here and now. When I learned Greek at college, my teacher uh, taught us this particular tense called the aorist tense is expressed perhaps like this. It's just a moment, momentary action that takes place, it's over, it's complete. Whereas the present tense would be like... And uh, it's a very good, for me, it was a very good illustration of understanding the, the tenses of the Greek language. And so this conversion is something that God can do for us only. We receive it. It's a passive thing we receive, allowing God to do that for us. And it's done um, in, a, in a change, in a moment. It's a conversion. It's a change of direction. Instead of going headlong to eternal destruction, God converts us, turns us around. We allow him to do so, and we turn and face toward the kingdom of God and eternal life. That's the privilege that God offers to us. And he says, you will um, become, this is the second verb in the sentence here, you will become <coughs> as little children. Again, this is in that aorist tense. It's a, it's a completed action. You will become. Not you will, you will just gradually grow into becoming. It will happen. You will, and when you're converted, you will become as a little child, as, a little, as little children. But this is done in the middle voice, not in the, not in the uh, passive voice, but this requires cooperation. It's a, the middle voice. You're active, middle, and passive. The passive is an action done toward us. The active is something we do ourselves. I throw the ball to you. I receive the ball if you throw it to me. But in the middle voice, it's a cooperative thing between both the active and the passive parts of the um, subjects. And then finally, in that sentence, it says that um, you will by no means enter the kingdom. And again, this is, again, in the aorist, it's a completed action. You will not, by any means, it's a very strong denial. You will not, you cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you do become as little children. But this is then in the active voice. This is something you will do. As you submit to that first uh, transformation and become as little children by cooperating with God, ultimately you will enter into the kingdom of heaven as a choice you make. And Paul writes in the book of 2 Corinthians, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so this reminds me very much of the way that Jesus described it in John chapter 15, where he said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Unless you abide in me and I in you, you cannot bear fruit. And so to be in Christ means to be like a branch attached to the vine, allowing the nutrient of the vine to course through the arteries of the, of the branches, if you like, thus allowing fruit to grow on the branches. So being in Christ allows the, the, the flowing of the Holy Spirit into our hearts and lives, giving us true life, spiritual life. Just as the, the, vine, the great vine, if you like, the branches receive nutrient from the, from the rootstock, from the roots and the, and the main vine, allowing fruit to flourish on the, on the branches. And this, of course, is what God wants to see in our lives, spiritual fruit, whereby um, he will be glorified. I'm just going to mention uh, one other text before I begin to wrap up. There's like a companion verses, I suppose. Ezekiel 36, 26 to 28 is a promise where God says, I will give you a new heart and I'll put a new spirit within you. I will take away the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. And then you will dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people 
and I will be your God. And this is, this is a quote that's referenced somewhat in um, Hebrews 10, even though uh, Jeremiah 31, 33 has a very similar wording. In, in Hebrews 10 it says, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. And so God has uh, provided a very promising future for those who will allow him to do this work of transforming grace in our lives. He promises a new heart. He promises a new life. We are new creatures as we submit ourselves to this process of conversion that God wants to do in us. So the promises are there. The Bible is, these are just a few samples of the promises we find in the Bible that God will, has promised us a new heart experience, a new mind, to write his laws upon our hearts and minds. And uh, those, those promises are there if we would accept some very simple conditions. And um, I guess the first condition might be that we ask, that we actually ask God, Lord, please help me. Lord, please give me that new heart experience. Lord, please send your Holy Spirit into my life that I might have that transforming experience that maybe I can't understand, but nonetheless people will see that I'm not the person I used to be. And people will be led to glorify you. King David wrote in Psalm 51 and verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. That uh, prayer, of course, comes from a, a broken and wounded heart. A man who had fallen into gross error, gross sin, adultery and murder. And yet he uh, recognises the, the, the desperate nation, uh, situation he's in, having uh, taken a woman by, uh, in adultery and then having her husband murdered. He recognises his grievous error. As God, if you're familiar with the story, God sent Nathan to him to speak to him about what he'd done. And of course David recognises this is God's message to him and calling him to, to acknowledge what he'd done wrong and to seek God's mercy and forgiveness for what he'd done wrong. And this is exactly how David does respond. He says, Lord, create in me a clean heart and uh, a renew a steadfast spirit within me. In uh, Isaiah 64, verses 8 and 9, it says, But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you our potter. And all we are, and all we are the work of your hand. Do not be furious, O Lord, nor remember iniquity forever. Indeed, please look. We are all your people. You know, you may remember, as I shared earlier, my reluctance to go to the cardiologist. It wasn't because I was fearful of what he might find. I was fairly confident that there was nothing wrong with my heart. Perhaps I didn't want to spend $814. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's a challenge that we sometimes... Uh, maybe diagnose ourselves and think we're all right. We look at ourselves, we look at our performance, our behaviour, we think about how others think of us, and uh, you know, often we surround ourselves with people who think well of us, people who don't like us and don't think too much about us, we probably avoid. And, uh, and therefore we build up a picture of ourselves which is perhaps not entirely correct. And so it's not easy for human beings to, to come to the, to the one who will be entirely true and honest. I think in Revelation he's called the true and faithful witness and where he there describes our condition as wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. What a challenging way of, to receive that for human beings, isn't it? But God is honest with us. But he doesn't leave us there uh, with this diagnosis of wretchedness. He offers us a way out. He offers to give us a new heart, a new experience, a new life, to be made new creatures. And it's simply there available to us if we reach out and ask him to fulfil what he promised to do for us. Any of us can do that. A young child of five or six or eight can do it. An adult in their 80s or 90s. I've seen a man baptised 90 something years old, baptised in front of the church and he, he burst forth from the waters of the baptismal font. And it was like a, like a slow motion movie almost. And the water just broke and he raised his arms in celebration, this 90 plus year old man receiving new life from God. And so none of us are uh, uh, restricted. God welcomes and invites all to come 
and to seek from him this new heart experience that will transform our lives. And maybe I'm preaching to the choir here today. Maybe, um, maybe this is something we've all experienced. And I praise God if that's the case. But maybe there are some here, to, here today who've, who've been reluctant to take that step of faith and reach out and say to God, look, Lord, I need a new heart experience. I recognise as I look at my life, as I look at the way I treat other people, as I look at the way I treat myself, there's something missing, there's something wrong. And I need you to help me. And it may be some small insignificant issues. There may be monumental issues that are crowding out any sense of peace or hope in your life. But regardless of what the issues may be, God is there simply knocking on the door of our heart, asking to be let in. And there's no door handle on the outside. It's only for us to open the door and say, Lord, please come in. Take over my life. Transform me. Make me like Jesus. Take away the heart of stone and replace it with the heart of flesh that I might uh, be able to live a life that will bring honour to you. We need to realise that we need professional help. Our GP um, is not a diagnostician, so if she sends you to the professional who can, has all the equipment and the expertise and know-how, and in terms of spiritual matters, only God is the true professional. He's given us the scriptures that we can consult, like the uh, workshop manual for spiritual doctors, and we can find there a true diagnosis of what our condition is, but also guidance and advice and a prescription for a remedy that will not leave us here with broken hearts, with wounded hearts, with uh, hearts filled with deceit or self-deceit, but uh, he can give us a new heart experience that uh, no one else, nothing else can do for us. Only he can truly diagnose our condition. Only he can provide the prescription for our disease. Only he can put our broken hearts back together. God bless you, folk. As you uh, meditate upon this message, I hope and pray that you will um, respond to God's invitation to allow him to be a part of your everyday lives. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you today that we've been able to come together here to worship you. We thank you for the beautiful uh, song we heard earlier. And we thank you, Lord, for the fellowship that we have where we can come in here as strangers and uh, leave here at the end of the day with new friends. I pray, Lord, that uh, most importantly, we will today choose you to be our new best friend, allow you to counsel us, to guide and teach us. And Lord, um, where appropriate, Lord, we pray that we'll open up to you and allow you to bring about that transformation in our lives that is so needed. So thank you, Father, for being here with us today. We pray you'll bless us into the new week. We pray that you'll be with us as we enjoy some fellowship outside. We thank you for those who've been working uh, behind the scenes preparing our meal. We ask you to bless the food that's been prepared, prepared and those who've uh, so lovingly provided it for us. And we just thank you and praise you, Lord, that we've been here today to worship you. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, friends. We'll see you again next week, I hope. There is a song? Oh, Barron said there was no song. Okay, we're going to have a special item, is that correct? Yes? Okay, sorry, uh, I was told we weren't. So come and join us for our song if we're, if we're going to do that.
Jesus offered and died to a world that was lost. He gave all he could give to show us the reason to live. As the years went by, we learned more of our gifts and giving of ourselves and what that means on a dark and cloudy day a man hung dying in the rain because of love because of love because of love we are the